Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Taste of Art, a program that is offered in partnership with the Lehigh University Art Galleries and Art Bites with Maite Gomez Rejon. Um, we are here today to explore chocolate, um, and we are going to um, also explore the work of two artists within the LUAG collection, uh, Carlos Jurada and Lydia Panis. Um, Lydia Panis is part of an exhibition that we have up this semester. Um, actually, I'm sorry, from uh, September through May of this year. That is part of uh, Hear Me Roar, which is women photographers from the LUAG collection. Um, and so we're going to start first with Carlos Jurado. He is um, a Mexican artist that was born in 1927. He explored lots of different mediums within his work. He was a muralist, he was a photographer and a painter, um, but he really enjoyed the process of traditional format photography and alternative uh, format photography, meaning using various means um, to capture images. And so he was kind of a leading photographer in um, the pinhole camera um, kind of realm. So he would develop and create his own cameras that he used to capture kind of everyday life, um, especially exploring Mexican culture and heritage within his work. Um, and he studied at the National Indigenous Institute and um, was really kind of a, a leader uh, within photography and the muralist movement. Um, and as we see, his work really has this kind of halo effect that the pinhole camera would create. So it was typically made from a box without a lens um, where the image, the paper was put within the box, a kind of a light sealed box, um, photographic paper was put in the back and then the image was inverted onto the paper backwards and then processed with chemicals in the darkroom, which we don't do very often these days. Um, and we can really see kind of that handmade quality within his work. And he often tried to capture kind of the cultural um, food and, and cuisine. And you, we can see kind of some of that with the local produce that is in this um, photograph here. Um, and then this is, he did a lot of um, still life photography and he often would include the female figure within his work as well. Um, and we can see here that it almost has that, um, he cropped it or his composition is really focused in on the process of the pinhole and kind of really accentuating the roundness of the photograph and how he composed that together. Um, and as we explore kind of this female form, it's a nice segue into Lydia Panis's work. Um, Lydia is a local photographer. She is from Kutztown, PA. She also um, shows her work in New York City and really all over the world and is, is well established. Um, and she explores, um, oh, I'm in the wrong, uh, I should have moved this to the next part. Um, she explores different materials that, um, that are play a part in her role as both a female, a mother, um, and also someone whose family emigrated to the United States. And so she uh, really found this um, connection with chocolate. Um, and over the years, over the course of like uh, 10 or 15 years, she collected Baker's chocolate, um, really high end, um, this like beautiful charcoal chocolate um, that she would photograph in various composition and show kind of the collection as it would grow over the years. In the same way that she did that with um, other materials like lint that she would collect from the dryer, from doing her children's laundry, um, and her own hair that actually would, would fall out of her head, kind of showing kind of the progression of age and motherhood um, as, a, as a woman and kind of um, how that impacted her own life. So we see here these beautiful composed stacked chocolate bars. And also she would take time to kind of create this intricate details and carve into them. Um, and she has actually some really interesting um, videos on her website too of her stacking the chocolate and the process of it crumbling and then rebuilding and then crumbling and rebuilding. So a lot of symbolism within her work and how she explores both her own identity um, and how we view ourselves, but how we're viewed by others. Um, and she captures that within, within her photographs. 
Um, and these beautiful chocolate bars tie in so nicely today with um, the recipe that Maite is going to lead us through um, and the exploration of chocolate in itself and kind of its cultural um, heritage and, and the significance of it um, and history of it. So um, as we segue from Lydia Panis's work and kind of her exploration of chocolate, um, there's a really deep history of the cacao bean. Um, and so Maite is going to lead us through kind of the history of that at, before we make our own fudge. Yes, exactly. I'm so excited. Um, can we go to the to the tree? Yeah. And then go but and then we'll we'll go with this one. So thank you, Stacy. I'm I'm so excited to to be here to be doing this with you and of course to explore chocolate. And I was so excited when I saw both of these artists, you know, work on your, on the, on the Luag website and just Carlos Jurados' work is just so beautiful. And, and I'm excited to make a pinhole camera with you and try to capture his techniques using, using our iPhones, um, but also Lydia's work and, and just, you know, chocolate specifically. And just, I was so taken by the way she balances things and just how, how sensual it all looks. I mean, even everything that you're saying about her, you know, the symbolism behind it for, for her, but as, you know, a viewer, just, just how beautiful it is, right? And just also for me personally, how, how loaded, you know, the image, the, just chocolate is and how many layers of history. And even with her stacking, like there's just so much to history. So I thought, let's make fudge, let's stack it, let's photograph it. And, and, and honoring, you know, Carlos Jurado's uh, heritage as well. I mean, chocolate is native to Mexico. Um, it is one of the most beloved ingredients in the world. Um, and it has been cultivated for, for thousands of years. I mean, it is believed that the, that the Olmecs um, were the first to actually cultivate chocolate. And for centuries, chocolate was consumed as a drink, you know, starting around the year 600, um, it was consumed as a drink, prepared as a drink by the Mayans. And it was something that was only consumed by elites, by nobles, by priests. It was just such a prized commodity. Um, it's a fruit. I love this whole idea of, you know, chocolate is a fruit and it grows, you know, on trees like we're seeing in this image here. Um, and it grows, it's, it's native to Mesoamerica, native to Mexico. I have a cacao pod right here, like the ones that we're seeing on the, on the tree here. But chocolate is so interesting. It has so many deep religious, you know, it's deep religious significance. You know, it's in, con you know, in contrast to corn, which is also native to Mexico. Corn needs full sun to grow, um, but chocolate is the opposite. It needs shade to grow. So one of them, in a sense, you can think that one of them represents life and the other represents death. Um, so it is, the Mayans believe that the very first tree that ever grew was a cacao tree. And it really connects the underworld with this world, with the heavens, with its canopy. So it has so many, you know, layers and so much significance. Um, but the tree itself, it needs to be, especially when it's young, it needs shade, it needs to grow very carefully. It grows 20 to 40 feet. The tree can live about 40 years. So it has not a huge lifespan, but you know, it has a pretty good run. Um, and it has these pods. Um, so a tree has about 30 of these pods. It takes about four or five months to ripen. And then each one of these pods has beans in it, right? The, the cocoa beans that are in it. So it has about 20 to 40 of them. And this is what, you know, the chocolate is. So when you open up these, these pods, these, these cocoa pods, um, you can see all of the beans inside, the cocoa beans that you can actually hear in this, almost like a little rattle. So there's about 20 to 40 beans in that pod. So they're surrounded by this white pulp. So the pulp is removed and then the beans themselves are laid out in the sun to dry. And then after they're dried, they're roasted, and then they're ground. 
Um, so the, the Mayans and then later the Aztecs, when they would grind them, they would add um, flavorings to them like vanilla or chiles or fruit, um, but it wasn't a sweet drink. It was a very, very bitter drink. Um, in fact, the word chocolate or chocolate comes from the Nahual, which is the Aztec language word chocolatl, which literally means bitter water. So it was a bitter uh, drink made with water because um, dairy, you know, cows were introduced post-conquest um, and it was very frothy. So it was, it had a lot of, um, a lot of the, the, the fat in the, in the cocoa beans um, produced a lot of froth. Um, so it had to be, it was a frothy drink. It was spicy. Um, and we see a lot of evidence in them in Mayan vessels. Um, but I mentioned a little while ago that it was consumed only by the elites. And it was so prized that it was also used as currency, the cocoa beans that almost look like little almonds. Um, but let me actually, you can see that it has a, a, a skin, almost like an almond. It has like a peel. So this after they're dried and roasted, um, before they're ground with all of these flavors, the skin needs to be removed. So I'm just kind of squishing it a little bit. And you can kind of see that I'm removing its skin. Um, so you see this chocolate, this literally just 100% dark chocolate. I'll move my fingers out of the way, but I'm just removing the skin. This is chocolate. If you go to the store and buy cocoa nibs, this is what that is. It's literally, I mean, it kind of falls apart. I didn't even press it very hard and it falls apart. So this is, these are the cocoa nibs. This is basically what you're getting. So it's 100% dark chocolate. This was then placed in something called a metate, which is this grinding stone with flavorings put in hot water to create this frothy drink. But among the Aztecs, the cocoa beans themselves, which look like large almonds, were used as currency. Um, so they didn't have money like we do today, um, or you know, coins or dollars, bills, or anything like that that we do today. Everything functioned on the exchange, you know, system. Um, so everything was transactional. Um, and there is evidence that. Chocolate, if you had chocolate, you could buy a lot of stuff. Um, so if you had one, you could buy one ripe avocado or five little tomatoes or one big tomato. If you had three, no, if you had, if you had 30, you could buy, no, sorry, take that back one. If you had three of them, you could buy a turkey egg. If you had 20, you could buy a cup of ice cream at the market. Um, ice cream, which was taken from ice from the local volcanoes and then seasoned with fruit, maybe a little bit of honey or agave. But if you had a hundred of them, you could buy a lot of stuff. So I have an image of what you could buy with 100 cocoa beans. So if you had 100, you could buy a lot of stuff. You could buy an entire turkey. You could buy three little rabbits. You could buy 33 avocados, freshly picked um, 33 fish wrapped in maize husks. So it's basically 33 you know, fish wrapped in corn husks. Or you could buy 100 large tomatoes, not little tomatoes, but 100 large tomatoes. You could also buy one uh, white cotton tunic. Um, so, and of course, when the Europeans arrived in the Americas, in Mexico, and saw this, they just wanted their hands on chocolate. It represented money to them, which it literally was. Um, we could we could get off of the of the the screen share. Thank you. Um, and so when they took it back to Europe, when they took it chocolate back to Europe, um, it arrived around the same time as tea and as coffee. So these were these bitter, exotic drinks that gave you know a jolt. They were coming from these newly colonized parts of the world, but the Europeans weren't used to this kind of bitter flavors. 
So they started adding sugar to them. They started adding milk to them. They started adding cinnamon and, you know, just different spices that were coming from all around the world, essentially domesticating this exotic, this, these exotic, you know, new commodities. And it really was a huge part of imperialism and colonialism. Um, it was something that was consumed only by the aristocracy, first in Spain, then in Italy. By the time we get to 18th century France, um, Marie Antoinette had her own chocolate maker. There was a person on staff that only made chocolate for her. Um, and it was, wasn't until the 19th century in England um, that we see the actual first chocolate, chocolate bar um, that we see you know, today that people really started eating it like we do today. The baker's chocolate that we see in Lydia Connors' work, that is something that's only been around since the 19th century. And Cadbury, this English company that's still very much around today, um, they were the pioneers in the chocolate bar. And this was because Queen Victoria um, was a total chocoholic. Mm. Um, but going back to, to this whole idea of currency, they've discovered in Mexico, in archeological sites, counterfeit cocoa beans. So what they would do is take the pit of an avocado and carve the pit of an avocado, which kind of weighs the same as this, um, and try to buy things at the market. It's kind of amazing, right? When we think of, you know, chocolate, not a big deal. It is a big deal. It has so many, many layers. And now it grows all over the world. And then much of it even grows in Africa. And it's still tied into colonization and imperialism and all of these sort of dark side of chocolate and sugar and coffee and tea. Um, we won't get into that part, I don't think, right? Just keep it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, just keep it. Um, but so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna make some chocolate fudge. So not exactly the baker's chocolate, but we're gonna make some chocolate fudge that then we're going to stack um, and try to recreate maybe some of Lydia's, Panos's work and photograph it in the style of Carlos Jurado. So I have in this bowl right here, and this is very, very simple to make at home. You can make it in a double boiler that I, like I'm doing today, or you could just do this in the microwave. But I have a bag of chocolate chips. So it's basically 10 ounces of chocolate chips. Bags usually come in 10 ounces or 12 ounces. Whatever you have, just a bag of chocolate chips. Bag of chocolate chips here. And then I have, uh, I'm gonna use a double boiler. I have about an inch of water here. I'm gonna heat this up. Oh wait. I'm having this, this wasn't working last week and I scheduled somebody to come see it and then it started working and I canceled the now it's not working. So I'm just gonna heat up some water. I might say if, so if we, if someone doesn't have a double boiler at home, do you have a suggestion of how they might work around that? Well, if you don't have this at home, um, so, so you can just put this, put the chocolate in a microwave safe bowl and put it in the microwave at like 30 second intervals. Um, so just do it really slowly. At first you're gonna feel like, oh, this is never gonna melt, but it will melt. But you wanna do it slowly because chocolate, if it gets to the point where it burns and if it burns, you're done. You, you can't really bring it back. Um, so I just have a pot of water, an inch of water, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, just a saucepan with an inch of water. And what it's gonna do is gonna create some steam. Um, so we don't want the bottom of the bowl with the chocolate to touch the water. We just want the steam that's in between the, the, you know, the bowl and where the water is, that's gonna melt the chocolate. And this is called a double boiler. So here I have, this is the simplest recipe and it's so delicious. I make this to give as gift around the holidays to everybody. So bag of chocolate chips, I'm going to add one teaspoon of vanilla extract. Vanilla is also native to Mexico and it was actually used as incense in perfumery as incense. And one can of sweetened condensed milk. So if 
The hardest part of this recipe is not eating the can of sweetened condensed milk. It's my favorite, it's my weakness. So one can of chocolate, I'm sorry, one can of condensed milk. And I'm just gonna set this over, just gonna set that over the double boiler. Um, and then I'm gonna come to it, you know, a, a few minutes here and there, just to mix it until it's really nice and smooth and glossy. And in the meantime, I'm gonna prepare the dish that it's gonna go in. So this is just, um, just a baking dish. You could use a square cake pan, um, anything you want. This is about eight inches. Um, so the smaller it is, the smaller it is, the, the, the skinnier your fudge is gonna be. Uh, I'm sorry, the smaller it is, the thicker your fudge is gonna be, the wider it is, the skinnier your fudge is gonna be. And then I just have some parchment paper. If you don't have parchment paper, you can use um, wax paper or even aluminum foil, that's it. Um, so I'm just setting it on top. And I'm just gonna press it down. It's not a big deal, it's gonna kind of come back up. Once the chocolate goes in there, it's gonna weigh it down and, and that's it. And so I think we should make our camera while we wait for the chocolate to melt. Okay. Okay. That sounds fun. Let's do that. Let's do it. So yeah, so you would wanna just take a piece of cardboard, cut it to about the size of your camera on your phone. Now some cameras look different. So depending on what phone you have, what, um, what version phone you have, you will wanna just figure out which um, lens is your main lens on your phone. So the one for the iPhone 12 is this, this one over here. And then it looks like Maite, you have a, what do you have, an iPhone 11? I think it's an 11, yeah. Okay. So, so I just I just tried and it looks like if I um, put my finger on the, it's the top one on the yes. 11. Yeah. So, Perfect. so then um, you'll take your cardboard once you have a good size. Um, I have tape ready just so that I can like get it taped on uh, right away once I get it placed. You can use any kind of tape. Um, I'm using painter's tape just because it holds well. Okay, I just um, have regular scotch tape. And then if you hold it up kind of near where your camera is and guess, you know, guesstimate, um, guesstimate where your uh, camera is, you just want to poke a hole. I'm using a thumbtack. You can use a safety pin. You can use a straight pin. Um, you want to kind of wiggle it so you have a good size hole and then do it on both sides to open it up. Okay. So is this a good, oh, I guess you can't really see it, but yeah, there's a- Yes, I can see that. that. That's okay. perfect. Perfect. Um, and then, you know, using the camera, you're gonna slowly zoom in. You're gonna find your hole and you'll wanna kind of try to center it on your camera. And then you're gonna tape it onto your phone. Let's see. Where is it? It takes it takes some finagling, and it also um, definitely want to go in slowly so your camera and your aperture has a time to has an opportunity to focus in. Okay, yeah, that's the key is to go slowly. And then you'd want to try to center, this is so cool. And then try to center it. So this is what mine looks like. Ah. Perfect. Look at that. This Crazy. is so cool. Oops, I just moved it. Oh, now I'm recording. Wait, hold on. Um, so there it is. It's like an eclipse. Yes. So, <laughs> and you know, in, in, older traditional photography, when they first started out, it was, um, they used pinhole cameras. They didn't actually have a lens in them. So this was a way to get an alternate image within a box and they would um, 
expose it on photographic paper and it would create this kind of halo effect. Um, and we'll be looking at Carlos Ferrado's work where he does that a lot. He explored alternative process photography. Um, and you can, once you take your photos, you can edit them, crop in, depending on how much of that ring you want or how focused you want the image to be. Um, but, so cool. Yeah. That's amazing. It's amazing to do something completely different with, to do something like old fashioned, old school with something so modern. Old school with the new school. We like to combine the two. Yes. yes. I love it. That's awesome. So and I, just, very I just took this in my office, just, you know, a, a close up of one of the um, traditional format photography uh, cameras That's I have. And so, you know, oh, beautiful. it's this kind of yellowy um, effect, which is really nice, halo effect. That's really, I have some chocolate here. Let me take a picture of these, these um, cocoa beans. Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. I love this. So this is this is a fun tool that you know you can you can really alter your camera and take it with you. Um, you can use it within your house. I mean, really, a interesting way to capture everyday life, but with a new lens, so to speak. Yes, literally and figuratively. <laughs> literally, literally and figuratively. Yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. Amazing. I love. I love that I just learned how to do this. It's gonna be so much fun to play with. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I'm just gonna I'll show you. So it's actually really starting to melt really beautifully. So I'll just lift it. So I just wanna, I'm gonna lower my heat a little bit because I just wanna make sure that the bottom so I have my heat on medium high. Um, I just want to make sure that the bottom of my chocolate doesn't get scorched. And I'm just mixing it continuously until I have a really nice and smooth chocolate. So started off mixing it every 30 seconds. And then you just want to continue mixing it until it's nice and glossy. You could use the same process with other kinds of chocolate, right? Like white chocolate chips and um, milk yes, chocolate. Yes, you can use it with anything. Mm -hmm. I'm using dark chocolate. You could use semi-sweet, bittersweet, milk chocolate, white chocolate, whatever you, whatever you like, really. Um, you can also, you know, add nuts to it. You can add... Um, you know, um, peppermint, you could just really add a little bit of salt to it. You could really add, you know, anything to it. Um, and it's just, it's a great, it's very simple. Um, it's all of the ingredients are very, you know, they're just easy to find and things that you might already have, you know, in your pantry. Um, so it's the simplest, it's the simplest recipe. Um, so let me just bring this uh, to the camera so that you could see. I'm just gonna turn it off the heat. So you could see how it's just a nice kind of glossy uh, chocolate. Looks delicious. It looks, it smells so good. So I have my parchment paper here and I'm just gonna drop it. And so you can see how this kind of smooth chocolate, I'm just dropping it in and it's gonna weigh down my uh, parchment paper. So I'm just gonna spread this a little bit. So keep it down. And then I'm just gonna use my spatula to spread it out. Oops. Um, look at that. It smells so amazing. And this is so simple. Again, I'm just spreading everything on here. I think the hardest part is not eating all of it before it hardens. It really is. It takes about an hour to harden. Um, 
And yeah, it's completely, it's impossible. It's the hardest part. Eating, first of all, not eating all of the condensed milk and then not eating all of the chocolate. I'm just spreading it out to get a nice layer um, as even as possible. And here it is. It looks like cake. It looks like cake batter, right? Um, it's just the chocolate. And all I'm gonna do now is put it in the refrigerator until it's really nice and firm. And basically just firm enough to cut into little squares. Um, and then we'll make our, and then we'll make our composition um, Lydia style. So I'm gonna just put this in the fridge. Okay. That's great. Okay. It's nice and firm. Okay. So I'm just going to, this is so simple. It's nice and firm, right to the touch. And let's so easily without any butter or, or anything, right? just with a parchment paper. And now there's Emma in the background. Um, and now what I'm gonna do is cut it into squares so that we can make our um, composition to photograph with our pinhole cameras. So I'm just gonna cut these ends off because I want it to look nice and um, just perfectly square like, like Lydia's Panos' photographs are. So I'm just gonna cut, first I'm gonna cut a perfect square, or not perfect, but a square. Cut these jaggedy edges off. So we have one block and now I think I'm gonna do, let's see. What should I do? Should I do big ones or maybe do it in thirds? Maybe I'll do thirds. Yeah, thirds would be a good way to balance. Yeah. So just want to make sure that you have a nice big knife to be able to, to do this. That is large. All right, so here we have thirds, and now I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do thirds this way as well. All right, now I'm gonna stack these. Okay, so actually, oh wait, never mind. I love how you um, reference the idea of layering history um, with the way that you're layering the chocolates. The chocolate. A nice yeah. metaphor. Oh, interesting. That's what she did, right? That she had that layer and then she had that, those stacks. It was very precarious. What do you think? Too big? It's hard to tell the scale from here. Oh, that's beautiful. It's quite large. Let me see if I lower this. Oh, I like the edges that you can see there. Yeah, kind of jaggedy. And it works for me to take a photo of it on the screen, which is pretty cool. Oh, that is cool. So it, it was, look at that. Oh, wow, that looks so pretty. Through a screen, no less. I don't know if you could see it, but I'll send it to you. Okay. <laughs> <Let> it <down. laughs> 
I think my finger okay. might be covering part of it. <laughs> Beautiful. So much fun. That's awesome. Thank you.